China has identified the cause of a mysterious new virus. A SARS-like virus which has infected hundreds in China has now reached the United States. This is truly an unprecedented situation. I want every American to be prepared for the hard days. In the first quarter of 2020, the world was brought to its knees by the novel coronavirus. The global economy suffered and many industries were affected, including wrestling. In 2019, AEW were on a red hot streak, but once the pandemic hit, they were forced to run shows without any crowds. AEW were restricted to Daily's place in Jacksonville, Florida for close to 500 days. Today, we're going to take a look back at the pandemic era period of AEW between March 2020 and May 2021 and determine how good the pandemic era of AEW was. But before we get underway, I'd like to give you guys a little notice on the status of this channel. To be completely honest, this channel may get terminated by All Elite Wrestling, AEW, due to copyright strikes. AEW have handed me a copyright strike on the video, MJF, the monster that CM Punk created, for using clips of MJF's classic promo. My first reaction was probably like yours right now. What the f***? And so I disputed the strike, but AEW did not change their mind. And then it sank in for me. Literally all my videos have clips from AEW, so they could hand me a copyright strike on every single video I have. And you only need three active strikes to get your channel terminated. Usually when one comes in, there's a strong possibility that more may come in as bigger channels than mine have been terminated for the same reason, like Bachomania or Showbuckle. Usually content creators like me are protected by fair use, which I won't get into the complications, but I firmly believe believe that my videos have been compliant with the fair use law, but unfortunately, I do not hold the power here. AEW does. And in a matter of clicks, AEW has the power to terminate the channel that I've built from the ground up through working endlessly and sleepless nights. The purpose of me saying this is to fill you in on the situation, because if this is the last time you hear from me, then thank you very much for watching and being there. I started this YouTube channel a little over 6 months ago and it's been a phenomenal journey. And we're now close to 7,000 subscribers with over 500,000 views. So far from all of you jobbers. I've talked to so many of you in the comments and it's truly wonderful discoursing about wrestling with all of you. I hope this isn't the end but if it is, thank you for everything. I really appreciate everything. But anyway, now that that sad jazz is out of the way, let's get right into the video. When the pandemic hit, AEW were fresh off their AEW Revolution 2020 pay-per-view, where the supposed greatest tag team match in wrestling history took place between the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega and Hangman Adam Page. This is where Orange Cassidy and Park stole the show and where Jon Moxley became the new AEW World's Champion. Between high TV ratings, quality wrestling shows and tickets selling like hotcakes, it's fair to say that AEW at this point were on fire, but unfortunately the pandemic Kid, and all of their momentum was put to a halt. We open up with the first pandemic era episode of Dynamite with Cody Rhodes speaking earnestly into the camera and this was very soothing because the world was going mad. The Elite was supposed to wrestle the Inner Circle in a blood and guts match which is a match in a two-sided cage but then the pandemic stopped that from happening. In the first pandemic era episode of Dynamite, the exalted one Mr. Brody Lee and Broken Matt Hardy debuted. They both debuted in spectacular ways but it was a far cry from how their debuts would have gone if it was in front of a screaming crowd of thousands of people people, as AEW crowds have a reputation for being passionate and rabid. These two debuts really positively affected the atmosphere and the reception for the first Pandemic Era episode of AEW Dynamite. The first Pandemic Era episode of AEW Dynamite was very very solid, especially considering that it was the start of the pandemic and lots and lots of international talent had to go home, and a lot of talent was spread across America so they could not travel to Jacksonville, Florida. One of the biggest losses at the time was the inaugural AEW Women's Champion, Riho, who had to go back to Japan. During the start of the pandemic, the women's division was almost non-existent. The women's champion at the time, Nyla Rose, also could not make AEW tapings because she was stuck in her home state, and the women's division was truly suffering at this point. In the early episodes of AEW Dynamite during the pandemic, AEW was really, really struggling. Because there was a lack of talent and the continuity of most storylines was broken, and no crowd wrestling was honestly really hard to get used to. Wrestling with no crowds truly made you understand how important crowds are in wrestling as they add a new dimension to the match. The lack of atmosphere was evident in John Moxley's first title defense against Jake Hager, which was a good match but it was very very quiet. To combat this, AEW added wrestlers on the sidelines to watch the match to add to the atmosphere. And while this did help out the match, it wasn't enough. It also didn't really help that a lot of the matches were against jobbers. But one positive that we could take out of this was Anna Jay was one of the jobbers. AEW had to shoot about 6 episodes of AEW Dynamite in 3 days in the Nightmare Factory warehouse. And this was not the most exciting setup. And this this 
hurt the ratings for the show. Before the pandemic started, AEW was averaging about 800,000 viewers every week, but during the early pandemic episodes, the average dropped to about 600,000 every week. The show was really, really suffering. There were some good moments during these early episodes though, like Hikaru Shida and Britt Baker's first match, and the street fight that happened between the Inner Circle and Kenny Omega and Matt Hardy, in which Sammy Guevara got hit by a golf cart. But for the most part, it was pretty hard to sit through an episode of Dynamite. AEW announced the tournament to crown the inaugural TNT champion, and this tournament was probably the most exciting thing to happen on the show every week. This tournament showcased stars like Lance Archer greatly and made him into a monster heel. All of this led to AEW's first pandemic era pay-per-view, Double or Nothing 2020, and the finals of the TNT tournament took place between Cody Rhodes and Lance Archer, with Cody Rhodes picking up the win and getting presented with the TNT championship by Iron Mike Tyson. We got provided with premium meme content Content that night from Mike Tyson. During this pay-per-view, MJF stole the show by putting on a bang of a match with Jungle Boy, and Brian Cage appeared as the Joker in the Casino Ladder match and won the match. Hikaru Shida also became the new AEW Women's World Champion by defeating Nyla Rose, and John Moxley retained his championship over Mr. Brody Lee. But where this pay-per-view really shone bright was in the main event, which was a stadium stampede match. This was a cinematic match that took place in the TIAA Bank Stadium. This match was filled with many memorable moments, and it showcased that AEW weren't afraid to be creative and take risks. A lot of people didn't like this match, but more people loved than hated it, so it went down well. The winners of this match were the Elite. This pay-per-view was generally well received and was AEW's highest grossing pay-per-view to that date with 105,000 buys. After this pay-per-view, AEW Dynamite became way better as on the first episode post Double or Nothing, FTR, formerly known as The Revival, made their debuts in AEW. FTR confronted the Young Bucks and this was huge because the Young Bucks and The Revival was a match that was being teased for years. On this episode as well, the epic brawl between Chris Jericho and Mike Tyson happened and this managed to bring a lot of new non-wrestling eyes onto AEW. Cody then started his open challenge for the TNT Championship. This open challenge was a stuff of legends. The beauty of Cody Rhodes open challenge was the unpredictability factor as anyone could appear and challenge Cody, anyone from an up and coming AEW talent to an indie darling or a former WWE star. We got introduced to many of our favorites today through Cody's open challenge like Eddie Kingston and Ricky Starks. Zack Ryder even came out for the save one week for Cody Rhodes. Seeing Cody fight against a new opponent every week and overcoming that opponent was really inspiring to see as he felt like the hero we needed in the unprecedented times of the pandemic. Cody's open challenge really solidified him as a top babyface but unfortunately his TNT title reign came to an end by the hands of Mr. Brody Lee. Mr. Brody Lee squashed Cody Rhodes in about 3 minutes and decimated him afterwards. Which was really shocking but all good things have to come to an end. Around this time AEW announced the AEW Women's Tag Team Tournament. With how bad the AEW women's division was at that time, it was a step in the right direction, but it seriously exposed the lack of depth that the AEW women's division has, with Ivelisse and Diamante winning over Brandy Rhodes and Ali in the final. After this, the trajectory of the women's division went upwards as Thunder Rosa and Serena Deeb debuted and turned the women's division around. Around this time, Darby Allen challenged John Moxley for the AEW World's Championship, and John Moxley and Darby Allen told an amazing story in their match, with John Moxley picking up the win. At this time, we were in a period where Hangman Adam Page his story was really really picking up as him and Kenny Omega were still tag team champs and Hangman Adam Page's descent into character purgatory started. He betrayed the elite under the orders of FTR and was kicked out of the elite. It turned out that FTR manipulated Hangman into doing this because they wanted an AEW world tag team title shot. Hangman Adam Page was so enraged by this that it affected his tag team with Kenny Omega and at AEW's All Out 2020, Hangman Adam Page and Kenny Omega faced off against FTR for the world tag team championships. This was an excellent match with FTR becoming the new tag team champions. Before All Out, AEW announced that they were going to allow fans to be in attendance at Daily's Place at 10-15% to of the capacity. So AEW All Out 2020 was the first pay-per-view with fans back, which was really awesome to see as it added more to the atmosphere of the show. At AEW All Out 2020, Hikaru Shida at Thunder Rosa had a really good women's match with Hikaru Shida picking up the win. Orange Cassidy beat Chris Jericho in a Mimosa Mayhem match by dumping Chris Jericho into a vat of Mimosa. MJF and John Moxley faced off for the World's Championship and the build up to this match was really good good as MJF showcased how truly precocious he is by cutting a phenomenal promo on John Moxley. John Moxley ended up retaining the world championship. This pay-per-view wasn't all that bad, but one thing really shat all over the pay-per-view, and this was Sammy Guevara and Matt Hardy's match. Sammy Guevara and Matt Hardy's feud was the most cursed feud in AEW's history. Sammy Guevara first busted Matt Hardy open really bad by throwing a legitimate steel chair at his face. Matt Hardy then got a receipt later on by busting Sammy open on his head in a tables match, and at All Out in their rubber match, the feud just got even worse. Sammy Guevara speared Matt Hardy off of a scissor lift and Matt Hardy's head bounced off the concrete. Matt 
Hardy was visibly struggling and stumbling all over the place, but for some reason, the referees and doctors allowed this match to continue, and Matt Hardy and Sammy Guevara climbed the high stage set, which legit made fans freak out that Matt Hardy could potentially get seriously injured. Matt Hardy ended up throwing Sammy Guevara off the stage set and picking up the win, but this match soiled the whole pay-per-view because it was early on in the night and it left a bad taste inside the viewer's mouth for the rest of the night. This is why AEW's All Out 2020 is the worst ranked AEW pay-per-view of all time. Clearly everybody was really worried for Matt Hardy as on the episode right after AEW All Out, AEW hit 1 million live viewers for the first time in over a year. The pandemic really messed up their numbers but they managed to fix it. On this episode of Dynamite, Matt Hardy assured everybody that he was fine and the best man Miro made his shocking debut in AEW and teamed up with Kip Sabian. The following week, there was an epic parking lot street fight between the best friends and Santana and Ortiz. This match was one of the greatest gimmick matches in AEW history and it was truly spectacular. It had the perfect ending with the best friends winning and then Trent's mom Sue flipping the camera off before riding off in a minivan with the best friends. Cody Rhodes then made a return from his Hollywood adventures and Mr. Brody Lee challenged Cody to a dog collar match at Chris Jericho's 30th year in wrestling special episode of AEW Dynamite. This dog collar match was brutal and bloody and Cody Rhodes picked up the win. This match should upset a lot of fans because people felt that Brody Lee lost the belt way too soon and that Brody was a sacrificial lamb to Cody's ego. This is where the hate for Cody Rhodes began. Brody Lee then disappeared from TV at this point. AW Dynamite was thriving at this current moment as ratings were high and they were putting on a banger of a show every single week. The eliminated tournament was then announced and the winner of this tournament would get a shot at the AEW world title. Former tag team partners Hangman Adam Page and Kenny Omega steamrolled through all their opponents and met at AEW's full gear 2020, with Kenny Omega picking up the win and earning a shot at the AEW world title. At full gear, the long term storytelling between Darby Allen and Cody Rhodes came to an end, as Darby Allen won the TNT Championship from Cody Rhodes. MJF also faced off against Chris Jericho, and the storyline was that MJF was trying to get close to Chris Jericho so that he could join the inner circle. One week, MJF and Chris Jericho showcased their impeccable on screen chemistry in the Ladina Debonair segment, where MJF and Chris Jericho broke out in song and dance. This segment was truly outside the box, and it showed that AEW were willing to prioritize creativity and take risks. Even though a lot of people hated MJF and Chris Jericho's impromptu song and dance routine, a lot more people loved it, and it even won an award from the New York Times for the best performance of 2020. The stipulation going to the match at full gear is that if MJF won the match then he would join the inner circle. MJF did end up winning the match and was the newest member of the inner circle. At AEW full gear 2020, Matt Hardy and Sammy Guevara had another match despite fans not wanting them to work with each other ever again. The fans accepted it because it was a cinematic match and Matt Hardy took the win in this match to finally end their feud. At AEW full gear, the long awaited match between the Young Bucks and FTR took place and there was a lot of pressure on both teams in this match because this match had been brewing for a long time but boy did they knock it out the park. This match was truly excellent and a fantastic spectacle of pure tag team wrestling. The Young Bucks ended up picking up the win in this match and became the new tag team champions. This match was the best match in the pandemic era for AEW with Dave Meltzer awarding it 5 and a quarter stars. In the main event, John Moxley faced off against Eddie Kingston and their feud was gold as the promo war that they had right before their match was such good shit. In the words of Vincent Kennedy McMahon, John Moxley retained the world title over Eddie Kingston. Full Gear was generally well received, but despite this, AEW only sold 85,000 pay-per-view buys, which was the lowest since AEW Full Gear 2019. On the Dynamite after Full Gear, a bunkhouse match between the Natural Nightmares and the Butcher and the Blade took place. And this was a bloody spectacle, of which AEW had become known for. On this episode, Jade Cargill also made her AEW debut, and Penta and Phoenix had a magnificent match in the main event of Dynamite, with Penta picking up the win. And then on December 2, AW had a Game of Thrones themed special episode of Dynamite and the icon Sting made an electrifying debut in AEW. It was so awesome to see Sting in AEW because as a viewer, you knew that AEW were going to treat him right better than when he was in WWE. Sting then proceeded to team up with Darby Allin. Kenny Omega also got his shot at John Moxley's AEW World Championship at Winter is Coming and he officially turned heel in this match and won the AEW World Championship and fled the ring with his associate Don Callis. Don Callis then announced that Kenny Omega was going to to go to Impact. This broke the paradigms of wrestling because it meant that Impact and AEW had a working relationship, which was exciting to see as a fan, but this partnership really only turned out to be a one-sided relationship as only AEW talent appeared on Impact. Unfortunately, not too long after this, it was announced that John Huber, Mr. Brody Lee, had passed away and this shook the wrestling world to its core. AEW broadcasted a special tribute episode of Dynamite to commemorate Mr. Brody Lee. This was one of the most beautiful tribute shows for any wrestler. Brody Lee Jr. was made the TNT champ for life by 
Tony Khan. And at the end, a beautiful montage of his life played. And it was a truly beautiful tribute for a truly beautiful man. This episode of Dynamite remains the highest rated episode of Dynamite to this day with a 9.85 rating. AEW then threw two special episodes of Dynamite called New Year's Smash. And Snoop Dogg appeared on one of these episodes and hit a splash on Serpentico. And the memes from this were absolutely hilarious. Kenny Omega also made his first title defense against Ray Phoenix at New Year's Smash. This was an amazing match and was awarded 5 stars by Dave Meltzer in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Kenny Omega ended up picking up the win in this match. Not too long after this, the AEW Women's Eliminated Tournament took place with the winner getting a shot at the AEW Women's World Championship. Half of the bracket took place in Japan and the other half took place in America. The woman who the AEW Women's Division was initially built around, Riho made a return and she wrestled an excellent match against Serena D. Real Mizunami from the Japan bracket ended up winning the tournament and earned herself a shot at the AEW Women's World Championship. Around this time, Shaquille O'Neal also wrestled on AEW Dynamite in a very decent showing, and this brought some more non-wrestling exposure to AEW. In Kenny Omega's feud with John Moxley, Kenta from New Japan Pro Wrestling made his shocking debut in AEW, and this is where the forbidden door that we all know and love today was born. This sent the wrestling world into a frenzy because it meant that New Japan Pro Wrestling and AEW had a working relationship. This made fans salivate over all the possible matchups that could happen in AEW. Kenny Omega then challenged John Moxley to an exploding barbed wire deathmatch, which was a match that had rarely ever been seen in the West. So there was a lot of hype behind this match. At AEW Revolution, this match happened and it was a bloody spectacle, and Kenny Omega retained the AEW World Championship. But the finish of this match sucked. Because the explosions didn't go off as planned, they were more like sprinklers. The explosion was a dud, and this upset a lot of fans because this was one of the most hype matches in AEW history. Because of this match, AEW Revolution sold 135,000 pay per view buys which was 50,000 more buyers than full gear, so fans were understandably upset. At Revolution, Hikaru Shida retained the AEW Women's World Championship against Ryo Muzunami, and Sting and Darby won an epic cinematic match against Team Taz. The Young Bucks also retained the AEW World Tag Team Championships against MJF and Chris Jericho. Right before Revolution though, the big show Paul White signed with AEW and he promised another big signing that was a Hall of Fame caliber talent that would join AEW at AEW's Revolution. This sent the wrestling world rife into a frenzy with speculation of who it could be. At AEW Revolution, WWE legend Christian Cage walked out and signed an AEW contract live on pay-per-view. This was crazy to watch because Christian had just appeared on WWE's Royal Rumble just a few weeks prior. Revolution was generally well received even though the botched explosion put a damper on it. After the AEW revolution, AEW came back firing on all cylinders as the first women's main event in Dynamite history took place between Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa. No one expected this match to be as brutal, bloody and awesome as it was, but Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa knocked it out of the park and put on one of the best matches of 2021, with Thunder Rosa picking up the win. This made everybody take notice of the women's division and this was Britt Baker's star making moment. At this moment, the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega were not on the same page as the Young Bucks did not agree with Kenny Omega's heel antics. But Kenny Omega eventually influenced the Young Bucks to turn heel and so the legendary heel Young Bucks were born. The heel Young Bucks were ruthless and they defended the World Tag Team Championships in one of the bloodiest matches in AEW history against SCU. At this moment in time, Hangman Iron Page was cozying up to the Dark Order. Miro then turned on Kip Sabian and he went on a path of terror as the Redeemer. Eventually, Miro won the TNT Championship from Darby Allen, and it was great to see Miro fulfilling his potential because quite honestly, Kip Sabian was holding him back. Yuji Nagata then became the second man to walk through the forbidden door as he challenged John Moxley for the IWGP US Heavyweight Championship on AEW TV and John Moxley retained. Cody Rhodes' infamous feud with Anthony Agogo also started at this time. This feud was doomed from the start as it was a nationalist vs nationalist UK vs USA feud. Cody Rhodes also then cut his notorious promo that solved racism. This was where the booze really started to get audible for Cody Rhodes. Their feud culminated at AEW's first ever full capacity show in over one year, Double or Nothing 2021, and here Cody Rhodes debuted his Homelander gear. A lot of people wanted Anthony Agogo to win, but Cody Rhodes took the win and this upset a lot of fans and made them turn on Cody for good. At AEW Double or Nothing, Sting wrestled with Darby Allin against the Men of the Year, and Sting stole the show in this match and showcased how much he still got it, and he picked up the win for him and Darby. The Young Bucks also defeated Eddie Kingston and John Moxley to retain the AEW World Tag Team Championships. Britt Baker had a true coming of age as she ended Hikaru Shida's one year reign and became the new AEW World's Women's Champion. Kenny Omega then retained the AEW World Championship in a triple threat match that will be remembered for the ages against Orange Cassidy and Puck. Where this pay per view really shined bright was in the main event though, which was a stadium stampede match between the Pinnacle and the Inner Circle. MJF had always been a prick in the Inner Circle's ass and he tried to get the members to turn on Chris Jericho, but instead they turned on MJF. 
MJF. But MJF is always one step ahead, so he formed his own faction, the Pinnacle, consisting of Wardlow, Sean Spears, and FDR. The Pinnacle proceeded to massacre the Inner Circle, and the Inner Circle and Pinnacle's feud culminated in a blood and guts match. This match was brutal as hell, and almost every man bled in this match, but the Pinnacle got the win in this match when MJF pushed Chris Jericho off the top of the cage. A lot of fans were upset because they felt that Chris Jericho's landing was too soft, but Chris Jericho legit fractured his elbow from this fall. Nonetheless though, this Blood and Guts episode of Dynamite was a massive success as it pulled in 1.2 million viewers and it was the first time AEW went number one on cable television. This was a star making performance for MJF as he closed out that episode of Dynamite atop the steel cage in a hue of glory. Because of the success of the Blood and Guts match, there was a lot of pressure on the stadium stampede match to deliver and it really did deliver. There were a lot of memorable spots and moments in this match. This match was half cinematic and half a real wrestling match. This was symbolic of the transition from pandemic wrestling to post pandemic wrestling. Sammy Guevara ended up picking up the win for the inner circle after giving Sean Spears a 630 senton and this inner circle celebrated with a live crowd in the middle of the ring to finish the show. It was so wonderful to see the crowd singing along to Judas like in the old days. At that moment it felt that pro wrestling had come back home. AEW Double or Nothing was very very well received because the full capacity crowd just added a dynamic to the show that hadn't been seen in wrestling for so long and was sorely missed. AEW started the pandemic off pretty roughly, but managed to slowly negate the pitfalls of no crowd wrestling through trial and error. Having a startup company face such a challenge like the pandemic so soon into their existence must have left Tony Khan and the wrestlers uneasy that they may not make it to the other side. But this caused AEW talent to bust their asses every single week, and the fans could feel their effort from their TV screens. Of course, pandemic era AEW wasn't perfect, but they sure did produce some of the best wrestling content during the pandemic era. And yes, the pandemic isn't over, but with the advent and the success of vaccines, it's not as bad as it used to be. If I were to rate the pandemic era of AEW out of 5 stars, like Dave Meltzer, I'd rate this period 4 stars. Pandemic era AEW will always be looked upon fondly because AEW was at its raw state, but they managed to put on awesome shows every week for the fans. Thank you for watching the video, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. But anyway, goodbye you jobbers.